Hello, this is Randy with Excel for Freelancers and welcome to the Monthly Meal Planner. In this training, I'm gonna show you how to create this incredible meal planner, complete with three meals a day, total calories, full navigation on a monthly schedule, and a whole lot more. I cannot wait, so let's get started. All right, thanks so much. I've got a fantastic training, the Monthly Meal Planner. This particular application, I'm gonna show you how to create your own meal application manager, complete with calories in total. You'll be able to add meals, subtract meals, clear, and put it all into a really incredible monthly planner. We're gonna do all that and a whole lot more today. If this application looks a little bit familiar, it is in the same workbook as the training we did a little bit ago called the Recipe Manager. We added this training, so we're gonna use the same database of recipes. We did this training a few weeks or months ago, and if you wanna watch that, I'll include the links down below for the Recipe Manager. So it's now in the same workbook. Of course, this workbook you can download absolutely free all you need to do is click the links down in the description below you can use your email or facebook messenger we're going to get that sent over to you right away for absolutely the cost of free if of course you do want to support us there are so many ways to do that and let me just tell you just about a few of those ways one is joining our patreon our patreon members get exclusive benefits nobody else gets including sneak previews and early bird specials including pdf code books where you can get all this in an incredible pdf detailed code book color coded organized code with a of course table of contents and an index on those pdf code books our patreon members also get incredible other benefits including something called a feature fix or focus where i focus on a specific issue or i use one of your suggestions and add features to these workbooks each and every week based on your own suggestions so you get your own custom feature added into these workbooks that and a whole lot more so i hope you'll join us on patreon all right let's get started on this calendar application i'm going to walk you through every step i'm going to show you every line of code and how we made this calendar the first thing what i want to do is show you how how do we make this calendar right with a calendar like this such as dynamic we have a lot of choices in this case we're going to be able to add a different start date so we take a look in the admin now keep in mind we've got an admin here this is the same admin that we used for our recipe so a lot of these things such as categories quantities units of measure that's all for the meal planner and we have some uh folders here that we're going to that we're going to take a look at but really the folder that we're going to focus on is the recipe pictures this meal planner uses pictures stored in a folder and you want to browse for that folder and locate that now of course our patreon members get all of the resources including all the pictures all the icons and everything else that went good so if you want to join us on patreon there's another benefit right there okay great so we understand that these pictures are going to be stored in a folder that folder is going to be stored right here in this recipe picture folder here we also want to customize the starting the scheduling maybe you don't want to follow every single day on your meal planner maybe you want to take out sundays for your cheat date so you want to color that and maybe you want your starting day to be on monday so we can customize that as well and returning back to the meal planner we now see it starts on monday sundays is that offset color that light brown for sunday and then that we can easily change it. So the schedule is fully dynamic. Let's go ahead and return it back to Sunday and we'll select all the days. So going back and we now see they're all in white and our day starting on Sunday. So we're gonna walk you through that. Also, we have the ability to select a different year so we can do that and that's gonna change all automatically like that. I'll get that to refresh, it should refresh. So we've got a lot to cover, right? So let's get into that and let's cover that and see how we're going to be doing that. First, let's take a look at this calendar. Okay, so we've got a calendar here and we want to set the start dates, but we want that start date to be dynamic, right? We want to let the end user know how, because every, you know, every country, every person might want a different start date based on their work or personal life. So we want to give them the ability to change that. And so we can do that with this drop down list here. And it's a drop down list of all the days. And all we did was just create a named range called weekdays. And then we entered that as a data validation here. So we can go into the data and we see that the data validation here is going take a look and we'll see that it's weekdays okay so we want to get them to be able to set that okay and we're going to give that a named range that's going to call it start date so that's our start day that is a named range that name we certainly want to be our first day here so all we need to do is just make sure it's uppercase and i want to set the start day right there so that's uppercase how do we get those subsequent days right if we know this is sunday then i got to put the next day as monday well because we've got a named range called 
uh, weekdays here. All I need to do is search inside that list here and find out if the next day is Sunday, if it's Sunday, right? That the day previous day is Sunday, then I know we're going to set the next day to Monday. Otherwise, the top one, otherwise we're simply going to increment it one down from the one. Like for example, if it's Wednesday, all we know it's one down from that. So that's how we're going to do it. So that's relatively simple. So what we're going to do again, doing upper, we're going to run a match. I want to look at the previous day. I want to find that, okay, inside the weekdays. If it's seven, meaning the seventh, the last day, then we need to automatically set it to the first day, K5, and that's Monday. Otherwise, what we're going to do is we're going to index those weekdays. We're going to use, we're going to find the row it's on. We're going to add one, and we're going to use that first column, index. And basically what that means, again, is as I just explained, we're going to look, we're going to find it. If it's the last position, we're going to change it to the first position. Otherwise, we're simply going to look for that day. When it's found, we're simply going to return the day after it. And that's how we automatically get those dynamic days up at the top. Okay, that's great. Now, we also need to get the days of the week. So I need to know the simple first day of the month. And I need to know if it lands based on this day. So what I want to do is want to determine that what month have we selected, what year, what month, and is that first day, does it land on a Sunday? So we've got some information here. We need to know the start date number. I need to know the number. What is the number of the start date? Our start date is based on the weekdays, zero function, right? What is it? What is that? Using the match position, right? Sunday is the last one in the list, right? It's the last one here. So we know that's the seventh position. So I want to get that day and I want to put that directly inside B3. I also want to know the first day of the month. What is the first day of the month? We're going to use the date figure and we're going to use both B6 and B5. Now B5 is going to let us know the month number. This change is based on the month anywhere from 1 to 12. And of course our year is going to be based on here, our year. So base, if we know the month and we know the year, then we can easily determine the first day because then we're going to use the date feature. The year is going to be whatever's in B6, the month is going to be whatever's in B5, and the day is always going to be 1. So how do, so we know this is dynamic. This will change automatically through VBA. The year, however, is based on a formula. Now we have a, an index named range here called years, and it's going to anywhere from 2022 to 2030. So I've created that, and that's based on years. So if I want to know what years are, I've got a drop-down list here that's going to set those years. Remind me to make sure that I run the refresh macro when we select this. Okay, I better do that now in case I forget, okay? So I'm just going to set this to the macro, which is called meal plan refresh, I believe. And then we're going to plan a refresh, and then that way when I change the years, it automatically refresh, which is what I want. So what we want to do is this has to be, this drop-down list here has to be connected to a specific cell. So when we format that cell, we see that it's connected to, uh, based on the input range of years, our named range, and we see it's connected to cell B9. So B9 is going to be anywhere from one, you know, whatever here. So if we do one, if we change it to the last one, of course, it's going to change to nine, right? So we've got nine different years that we're going to be checking from. And so on this, we know, if we know that this is one, what I want to do is I want to I've got the one here. It's connected to that one. What I want to do is I want to get a year based on this one. It is the first value. A two would be 2023. So we're going to use a formula, this formula, this index formula, to determine exactly what we have here. So here it's, we're going to basically indexing the years, and I want to return what is in B9, right? That's the row, and I want to return one because that is the exact column. It's only a single column. That is going to get us, that index formula is going to get us that year. It is that year based on this because this will return one through nine. So I need to convert that one through nine into a year. This formula does it here. Okay, then I also want to know here, moving down here, I want to know what day we've selected. If I select a specific day, I want that day to be show up right here, located inside L3. And I want it to be long day. So B10 is going to do that. That's linked to B10. So whenever I select a day, I want to make sure that we are going to change this particular day here based on the month selected day. So it's down here, B10. B10 here, down here. This is the selected day. This particular day here is not needed. So we're going to remove that. That is actually not needed. So continuing on, I want to know the header, right? What is that header there? I want to be able to be able to set that header as it changes, right? From March or whatever. I want to set that header so it's completely dynamic. So how are we going to do that? Well, what I want to do is I want to create a specific text value. And
And then I've got a text here. This particular shape here, this text shape, is linked to whatever's in B8. That way we can position this and we don't have to base it on any specific cell, which is a lot nicer. But we have to base it on some because it's going to be dynamic text based on whatever month we have selected. So we need it to link to a text and we've linked it directly here to B8. So what we do is we want the upper of whatever's in B4, right? We know the month start is here in January, but what we're going to do is a format. We know the starting date is 1 1, but what I want to do is I only want to display the month and I only want to display the year. So how are we going to do that? We're going to do that with a specific format. We can use the text function to do that. So we want that date, that first day of the month, but then I want to format it very specific based on the long month day, M, four M's, and I want comma, and then I want the four Y's. That is for the year. That is how we can specifically get it exactly the way we want it using both the upper and the text, and of course, basing it on the first day of the month. That's how we do that. And I also want to know, we already went over selected year. The selected days based on the day we'll go over into more detail and this selected meal column will go over a little bit the rest come with meals so we'll be going over that a little bit more but i wanted to focus on just this yellow part here which is the calendar function okay so now that we understand that what we need to do is we need to determine the first day of the month and we need to do is that first day of the month does it land on a sunday if it does put the one here if it doesn't skip it and we're going to continue to do that until we actually find what day in this case saturday that is the first day of the month and if it is we're going to put that one right there okay so how do we do that well we could do that with a formula feature and the best way to do that is to use the weekday function so the first one on e4 we're going to say if the weekday we're looking for the, using the weekday function the month start now remember that's our first starting day two equals the start day number this is where that start day number comes in handy remember our start day number is seven this particular seven is given a name range called start day number what i'm doing is i'm looking for that start day number i want to know if the first day of the month is also the same as that start date number and we're checking that in right here so we're going to check the first day of the month here month start right equals right the start day number of the month start right and that otherwise we're going to show empty so we're just simply no all we're doing that formula simply does is say does the first day of the month land on a sunday if it does then put that first start date then put that first start date if it doesn't show blank the next day here inside the monday is slightly different and the subsequent days then we're simply checking is the previous day here e4 previous day e4 if it is not empty right that means there's a date there's an actual date then it's simply the that date plus one but what if it is empty if it is empty then again i want to check but this time i'm checking to see if that monday is the first day of the month here we're going to use the same exact formula checking that if it's seven plus one we're simply checking to see if it's first day of the month if it is the first day, if that first day does land on a Monday, then we're simply going to do month start. So we're going to check. So we know that that's month seven there. Okay, so that's all we have to do. And then continuing on. So in each subsequent formula, all we're doing is checking the day above to seeing if it is a correct day, the first day of the month. And if not, we're going to show blank. So if it is, we're going to show that start date if it's not blank. So we're doing that with each subsequent day along the calendar. And that is it. That's all we have to do to just be able to do that. And it's very, very simple. All right. So we understand that how we get those days of the formula. All right. So and then all we have to do for the second row, all we're simply doing because we know it, all we're simply let me just highlight more than one cell here. All we're simply doing is adding what's in the one above the day above and then just adding one and we'll do that for each subsequent day so that's all we have to do okay so what about the conditional formatting if we see this we see we got some conditional formatting those non days of the month are in brown while the days of the month are in white and it continues down here too so we do that with conditional formatting so if we go in here and we go to conditional formatting and we manage the rules and we see we've got something here we got a few different formulas the first one is going to be e4 we're looking at e any column and then four only row four if that's empty we're going to show that dark color and notice that is only for the of course the first row of dates if it goes down here i'm going to fix that when you selection change it always goes to here i'm going to fix that and i'll show you how we, when we're into the selection change it means if we select more than one it's going to go right to here actually it's kind of cool it's kind of cool that we automatically when you select the day it's kind of cool because it goes right to that and allows you to enter a meal there's a reason for that it allows you to enter a meal very very quickly and save that meal so that was kind of why i did it but if you select more than one day it 
can. It don't, won't automatically do that, which is also good. All right, so continuing on. So we have some conditional formatting. We see how this particular conditional formatting, but we noticed that there was another conditional formatting, and that was that light color. And this, of course, is based on those day of the weeks. Let's refresh our memory. Inside the admin screen, we see when we don't select a day, we unselect, we want that day to be colored different. So we need to determine what day is, if there's a checkbox or if it's blank, if it's blank, then we need to make sure that that day is colored in this lighter brown here, this lighter color here. So how do we do that? Well, if we go inside the conditional formatting, and we manage rules, basically what we're going to be doing is we're going to use the indirect formula. We want to know based on this row. So based on, in this case, we're on row 18. 18 is our date row, 9, 10, you see, 11, 12. So those are our dates. So what I want to do is I want to look to this date. Now these, keep in mind, are dates. Notice it's only showing a number, but in actuality, they're actual dates. They're simply just formatted, right? So if I were to change the format on those, we would see that those are actually long days. But when we go into the more number formats, we can see that it's a custom number format showing only the day, but in actuality, it's, they are dates, they're full dates, but they're only showing the day, so we can use the day. If we wanted to show more than one day, if we wanted to show the date and the year, right, we would just have to put in day and then year. I don't know why we would want to do that, but we could do that right here, 922. So it'll show automatically with that if we want to change that. So within our conditional formatting, we can then base rules off that particular day, and we know that that's in row 18 right here. So what we can do is what I'm going to do is I'm going to use an indirect formula. And basically what I want to do is I want to determine what day is that. Is it a Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday? And I want to find that date using the admin, using the indirect, right, L, and 4. Now why is that? So if we're going to take this weekdays, E2, right? So I'm going to take that weekdays. Now I know that inside that formula, weekdays, our Monday is going to come first, right? So let's say this returns Monday, which is the one, right? If we add one plus four here under column L, what are we going to get? So if we take a look inside here on our admin, we have column L, all right, four, right? This is four plus one, plus one is Monday, right? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna check. If it's Monday and this is blank, then I know to color it. So when this is true, so all we're doing, this is four, this is one, this is two, three, four, and five. So simply, we're simply checking this cell here using the weekdays because the Monday will return a one, Tuesday will return a two, Wednesday will return a three. But I need to check this cell right here for Wednesday. If I want to check this cell, how do I do it? I know it's column L and I know that it starts in five, right? So if I know that, all I need to do is simply add four four plus the day number using the weekday function, right? So when we take a look at that, the weekday function, that weekday function will supply us with those numbers. So we give it a date, right? Any date, like, and then the second option here is that weekday number. So we're going to use two for that because we want Monday to be the first, right? Monday's our first up here. So we want Monday through Sunday, right? Monday through Sunday here on that, okay? So you can see that now. That's what we want to show. So we're going to use that two. Two on the weekday will give us Monday numbers, number one. So we're using that inside the formula here. That's going to get us one, two, three, and four. So we can count those. And we simply need to use the indirect. All I'm looking for is if it's blank. If it is blank, then show it. And that's exactly what we have under the conditional formatting. We're checking to see if it's blank. So we manage rules and we go back into this. We're simply locating that cell. We want to know if it's blank. If it is blank, then color it this lighter brown. And that's it. That's all we need to do. Those are the two conditional formatting rules that we have for this calendar. So that's relatively easy. Very cool. So we see that now, but now we got some really cool events here. So how do we do this? So the first thing of what I want to show you is when I select a day, I want that day to be here. Now keep that in mind that when we select a shape, we want something to happen. When we select a day, I want something to happen. If I select a day, I want to show what is going on inside that. I want to show the breakfast or maybe I want to show, let's pick this one, right? So this one here on January 3rd has one dinner and no breakfast. So breakfast is blank, lunch is blank, dinner has a a beef stroganoff, right? Which is looking pretty good. So what I want to do is I want to be able to show breakfast or show lunch using this really cool tab feature. This is an awesome tab feature because we only have limited space, right? Often what we do is we hide and show columns, but in this case, we don't need to. Here's a brilliant thing. I don't need to show. They're all using the same exact cells. So why not should I just load what is in breakfast 
when I click here, load what is in lunch here, and load what is in dinner. You see they all use the same column, L through M. They all use the same rows. We're not turning, we're not hiding or showing a simple rows or columns. We're simply adding the data for the for dinner. We're simply adding the data for the lunch, and we're simply adding the data. And then we use conditional formatting to simply show those tabs. So if we take a look inside here, we've got some conditional formatting. I need to know what, what column was selected. Right? I want to know. This is column, let's take a look at this, oh, what is it, 13, I think, right? This is column 13, right? So we, we're focused on columns 12, 13, and 14, these three columns, L, M, and N, right? So what I want to know is what column was selected. If it's the right column, the selected then highlight it and we know what column was selected because we have it right here located in b11 if i select a different column say lunch b11 is going to change right so i need to put that column here 12 13 or 14 if i select dinner here we're going to see that change to 14 obviously so we have dynamic this column we base so i can on the selection change event i'm going to put that column number that the user selected i'm going to put it directly in b11 and we're going to show you that in just a moment so therefore i can then apply conditional formatting based on the column that's selected so if i highlight these three cells and i go into the home and then conditional formatting and we manage rules we're going to see that rule play out now keep in mind this dark color with the white font is the actual particular color. It is conditional formatting that will apply the bold black italicized font with the lighter background. And all we're doing is simply basing it, the rules based on B11 and the column. If B11 equals the column number, give it this here. And all it's simply all we're going to be doing is formatting it to this darker through lighter, right? It's going to match that bottom. And we're going to uh, clear out, actually, there's no border on the bottom, so that's fine. The font is going to be bold italic. So that's all we have to do, right? It's very, very simple to do that. And so it's very, very easy, okay? So continuing on, and of course, the, the color is going to be automatic and not white. Okay, so we understand that. We know how to apply that conditional formatting. It is the selection change event, which we're going to get into right now, that will actually do it. So when I make that selection change, we are going to load those. And then all I need to do is just simply add a meal to that, save that meal, and that's going to be automatically updated on the schedule. And then we're going to be able to show it and we'll be able to select any day and then show the breakfast, lunch, dinner that's been selected on those particular on that particular day all right so let's get into the vba and take a look at that selection change and see how we really create these events okay so we're going to go into the developers and i'm going to go into click visual basic if you don't have that alt f11 will get you there and i'm going to focus directly on the meal planner the meal planner now notice there's other pages and other events here because this is a workbook that, that we've worked on before but we're building on top of that so Recipe macros and recipe sheet macros we've gone over before. We will not be going into these. That's part of another training, but I thought having those together would be kind of nice. We're going to be going over the, the modules meal macros and planner macros. So those are the two we're going to be going over. We're going to focus our attention on this sheet, the meal planner sheet, and we're going to focus on the database of meals planner. All of our meals database are located right here inside this database. We have a meal ID. We have a recipe name. We have the type. Is it breakfast, lunch, or dinner? the date that it's on, how many calories are associated with that because we have total calories, so that's very important. And we have the meal type row, right? This is gonna help us. Remember these rows, 16, 17, or 18, that's gonna help us in the future and I'll explain that as we get into that. So that's all we have to do there. So we have that information. So we're just gonna be focused on those two sheets and that's all we're gonna need for this particular training, relatively easy. Inside the inside the meal planner, we, again, we have gonna focus on our selection change, our worksheet selection change. Now, if the user selects more than one cell, we're going to exit the cell. Exit the cell. That is exactly why nothing happened when I was select. That's why something happened when I select one, but nothing happened when I select multiple, right? So when I select multiple, nothing happens because we're exiting the sub when the target, the, the selected number of cells is greater than one. Okay, so on a meal selection, if the user selects breakfast, lunch, or dinner, L5, through N5, then we want something to happen. And what do we want to happen? Well, the first thing what I want to do is I want to take whatever column they've selected and I want to place it directly inside B11. So that's the first thing that we're going to do. And we can do that directly with here. B11 simply equals the target column. Place the column number, I'll write that down, place selected column number inside B11. Okay, so that's relatively easy. Now what I want to do, I want to set the meal ID. Now each one of these, if you saw in the database, each one of these has a specific ID, a unique ID for every single one. I, what I want to do is I want to place that meal ID based on that. Now our meal IDs, we have different meal IDs. Breakfast has a meal ID, lunch and dinner. And those 
when I select a day, let's select a full day here, those meal IDs are going to be stored here, 16, 17, and 18. Those rows sound familiar, right? Our breakfast ID is 7, our lunch ID is 8, and our dinner ID is 9. Notice there's three meals, so each one has an ID. Whatever the selected one is, I want to place that ID. I want to know that ID, and I want to see where it's been placed. So what we're going to do is if I select lunch, right, I want to do is I want to load that all those details for that lunch. And I know that lunch is located in hide 8 right? Eight is our lunch ID. Those IDs are going to come. I want to take that ID and I want to place it directly inside B12. Because what I need to do is I need to load all of the details from that meals database. I want to load the recipe name. I want to load, the, I want to know the meal type, the date. I want to load all that, especially the recipe name, because that recipe name is going to trigger when I add that recipe name and it's going to get trigger all those details from the recipe and those recipes are located here this is our recipe database now our recipe database has contains everything else it contains a recipe id a recipe name category yields cook time rating nutritional information and some more information and we also have the description of recipe info and then lastly i have calories i put calories at the end this was an addition on this training only and i didn't want to upset the data we have we have multiple pictures, but in this training, we're only using picture one. In subsequent training, we used four different pictures. Why is that? Because in our recipes here, remember this is our original training, we had four different pictures. And I show you how to use this really, really cool look like picture navigation here so we could go alternate between multiple pictures. So that's why we use more than one picture. That's why our database contains more than one picture. If you haven't seen the recipe manager, I highly recommend it. It's a fantastic training. Okay, so our recipe database contains up to four pictures. However, in this training, we're only just using one picture. One picture for our, our thumbnail here, one picture down here. So when basically when I select a different recipe i want all that information to load in here i want all the details to load in here and i want the picture of that oh that looks good i want all of that in here this training makes me hungry so we got to load that in from the recipe so that's very very important so let's continue on with the code so what i want to do is i want to make sure on the meal selection we're setting that target then what i want to do is i want to determine the meal id but how do i know the meal id how do i know that if there's a meal id i know if i select breakfast we know we're selecting column 12 right this is l is column 12 so breakfast is column 12 we also know that it's column 12 of course by here what is here so if i know this is 12 but what i want to do is i want to look for that breakfast id that breakfast id will always be in b16 the lunch id will all if any will always be in b17 if i select a different day right with no meal ids we see there's no meal ids associated with this because this is january 10th and we look in the calendar january 10th we see there's no meals associated as soon as i add a meal and save it of course it's going to be saved right now we see breakfast of teriyaki chicken and now we see the breakfast id does 53 so as soon as we add a meal an id is signed here here and here so well, what i want to do is when i select a specific meal I want to take whatever that ID is and I want to place it directly inside here because this is our current meal, right? This is our, so I'm going to take that ID, but to get to that, if I know we've selected column 12 to get the breakfast, how do I pull that ID? I know the ID is located in row B16. So all I simply do is say B plus, I guess, 12 plus four so four is the difference right because column 12 we got we know it's column 12 but we need to get to row 16 so we simply add four and that's just what we've done inside here so inside this b12 our our current id b12 is where we want to place that meal id is simply going to be range b and the target column remember target column it could be 12 13 or 14 plus four so this is going to be 16 17 or 18 so be 16 17 or 18 based on whether it's breakfast lunch or dinner okay so that's how we automatically get that id now when we have that selected id i want to extract the row from that and i want to know what row is placed if we take a look inside our meals database that breakfast that i just added here all the way down at the bottom that teriyaki chicken here that breakfast is located in row 55. now i know you need to know what row it's placed in because i need to load all the details from it so to do that we need you're going to use a named range so if we take a look inside the name manager and we look under the meal id we see a meal id here and it's located here this dynamic named range based on the meal id so this is going to let us know so using that meal id we can then extract the row based on that meal number so inside the meal planner if i want to know it's on row 55 all we need to do is run a match based on what's in b12 meal id and then we're going to add two make sure we add two because 
Why is that? Because our first one starts on row three. So I don't want to return one if it's one. I want to return three. I want that row number. So we must add two to that. Okay, so that's going to extract that row number. And then I also want to know the next meal ID. This is relative ease. So for brand new meals, I need to know what ID to assign to that. And we've done this many, many times before, but the repetition helps us learn. Okay, so what I want to do is use the max formula, and I want to know the, the, la the most maximum meal ID plus one. That's going to get us our next one. If there's no data at all, it will create an error. So that's why we wrap it around if error, and we let them know that it's one. So if there's no data, that means the first ID is going to be one automatically. That's it. And I also want to know the selected recipe row. The selected, what is the row of the selected recipe? That's very important because our recipe database is located right here, right? We need to extract all the information from the recipe, and I need to put it in there. So I need to know if we're on creamy chicken tarragon, I need to know that that's in row seven or whatever. So how do we know that? Well, let's take a look inside this. Recipe row five, well, what is that? In our recipe database, we see on row five is our teriyaki chicken meatballs. Okay, so to do that, I think I'll cook that tonight. So to do that, what we're going to be doing is we're gonna be using, oh, get this one, our recipe ID, and it's gonna be based on the recipe name here. So we also have a recipe name. Under the formula as a name manager, we have another name range called recipe name. Okay, and this recipe name is gonna be based on all of them. I'm gonna use the match formula to extract that row based on the recipe name that the user has selected. So our recipe name is located directly inside here, inside cell M7. So these meatballs are inside seven. These look really good. Moving on. So what we can say is I want to use the match formula based on M7, the recipe name plus three. Why are we adding three in this case? Because our recipe, our first row starts on row four. So we must add three. And that's going to get us the recipe row. Once I know the recipe row, I can simply add all of the data. And we'll get into that on the worksheet change. That means when I make a change to that worksheet, I want that information to load here. So I want to bring all that information in. Great. So that's based on our change. So that's how we get it. So then what we do is, again, remember I said M7 select. We saw that before. So we covered why we set the meal ID. When I select a cell here, select any one of these, the next selection I want to make sure is M7. Why is that? Because if I select a day, right, that doesn't have a dinner, the next thing the user is going to do is probably add a meal. So what I want to do is let them know to select M7. That's going to be the next thing that's selected. So automatically, as soon as we make a selection changes on any one of these, the next cell that's going to be selected is M7. So we're going to force the user to do that simply by using M7 select, which will select the cell that contains the recipe and allow them to it. And next thing what I'm going to do is I'm going to run a macro called meal load and that's simply going to load in if there's an existing meal like this we're going to run a macro and that macro is going to load that menu in here it's going to load that meal in here including the picture we'll get into that macro in just a bit but this macro will run so we will always want to obviously if there's no meal there's nothing to there's nothing here but if there is we want it to load so that's what we're cap and that's everything that's going to happen if the user makes a selection on either that breakfast, lunch, or dinner in cells L5 through M5. So it's just this amount of code. What about on date selection? We, we saw some things happen when we select a specific date. Now there's two things. When I select a date, I want if, if there's nothing here, of course, I don't want anything to happen. So the first thing what I want to do is I want to check, is there a date here? If there is, then load that date. I want to load all of the menus. If I select a specific meal here, I want that meal to load. If I select a specific meal, I want the lunch. If it's dinner, I want the dinner to load. But what if I select just a blank day, right? Soon, you know, on a brand new calendar, we don't have anything. There's no meals to select here, right? There's nothing to select, but I want to add a meal to that. I should really clear that out, but it's okay. Clear it out on meant selection. Maybe we'll add that. So when, when I select a day, I want that day to be added. Notice the date's changing, right? So we want something to happen. But what's tricky about it is if I select this cell, I need to extract this date in this row, row 11 or I need to extract this date in row four, right? But if the user selects here, 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 I still need to select 18. So we need a formula that's automatically going to select the date above it based on the cell that they select. Because if I select the seventh and I wanna add a meal, here quickly and just click save meal it's going to add that automatically to that day so i need to know what so i need to extract the row out of this information so we need a formula we can use the mod formula to do it so if the user makes a selection anywhere from e4 through k45 anywhere from e it should really probably be e5 right that's okay all the last one here 
45, right? K45. If they make any selection, I want to check. One, is there a date? So that's the first thing, right? Is nothing, then do something. First of all, we're going to dimension the date row. I need to know that date row. Is it row 4? Is it row 11? Is it row 18, 25, right? So I need to know that row. Once I extract that row, I'm going to extract the date from the column, whatever column they've selected, and that row. We're going to check, is it a date? If it is a date, then we can continue on. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. So the first thing what I want to do is extract that date row. And what we can do is we can use the mod formula. The mod is a great formula. Now we see that there are six individual cells inside each date. They're all separated. So for every seventh row, we have a new date. So knowing that, we can use a formula. So what we want to do is mod. I want to get the mod of seven, right? The divisor of seven. When I make that division, mod, what is the remainder of that, right? So is it three? Is it four? Is it two? Is it one? So when we know that, all we need to do is take the target row, this is a little bit confusing, minus the target row minus four. Why minus four? Because our first one starts on four, right? So I want this row four, right? We're not going to be using it. So the first possible one is four. So we need to subtract out four. Our first possible one is five. And we're going to subtract out, in this case, we'll subtract out one. And then we get four. So that's how we do it. So target row minus four, right? We always say, because our first, if we were starting our calendar way up on row one, we wouldn't need to do that. But it's based on where we start our calendar. Then what we're going to do is we're going to take the mod four and we're going to subtract the target row. That's going to get us our date row automatically. So that date row, if I select here, it's going to be four. If I select here, it's going to be four. Here, it's going to be four. If I select here, it's going to be 11. Here, 11. So no matter where I select, it's automatically going to get that. This is a great little formula. This is going to determine the row of the date. Determine row of date. Once I know the row, then I can determine, is there a date here? So we can check that. So we're going to use that based on if the cells, the date row, plus the target column does not equal empty, right? That means there is a date, then I want to do a few things. I want to take whatever that date is, the date, the cells, date row, the date column. So this specific date, the selected date, and I want to place that directly in B10. B10 is going to be right here. And remember, this particular cell here is linked to whatever is B10. So I want to take that B10. I want to place it directly here. So it was going to take that date. That's automatically going to place that date here in this long date formula. Once I have that, what I want to do is then load, run the macro. It's going to load the day meals, starting with breakfast, if any. So that's that macros we're going to go over in a minute. So that's the select day. So that's all the macros for our selection change. It's relatively simple, right? We only have date selection and meal selection. Those are the only macros that we're going to actually go on. Now there's another macro I'd like to go over, and this one is going to be the change event. When I make a change to M7, I want that meal to load, but I only can load that meal if I ensure that this particular B15 contains a value. That means it is a correct row. And you know, a good feature maybe on Patreon, what I'll do, let's say it's not a correct row. What about if we want to add a brand new meal? Okay, maybe I'll do that on Patreon. I'll be able to add a brand new meal. So if it doesn't exist, you'll say, do you want to add this meal? Yes, I do. And then we'll need a browse picture for the button and we can fill in all this information and then save it as a brand new recipe. That would be pretty cool. Continuing on. Let's take a look inside the code that we're going to do that. So that's going to be based on the worksheet change event. Worksheet change event. On change of recipe, load the recipe details. So when a user makes a change to M7, that is when we want something to happen. Okay, so first of all, the kind of change is what if it does not equal empty? But what if it's empty? Well, if it's empty, I didn't show you this, we should really delete everything. So that's important. So we can delete everything. But what if, let's take a look at this. I also want to be able to clear it. So if it's nothing, if it's nothing, clear it out. But if it's something, then show that. So we're going to do two things. So if it does not equal empty, we want to do this. We want to run a macro called plan load the recipes. And that I'll go into that macro just now. However, if it is nothing, meaning the user has pressed the delete key and cleared the contents of M7 through N7, then we want to do something else. Then what I want to do is I want to run a macro that's going to delete that picture. If that picture doesn't exist, it could create an error. So the first thing what I want to do is delete this picture. This picture is always going to be called REC pick. Recipe, short for recipe picture. That I want to delete, but if it doesn't exist, it could create an error. And therefore, we've wrapped it in on air resume next and on air go to zero right here. The next thing is all we need to do is just clear the contents of the remaining cells. So M8 through N20, we're clearing the contents. That's going to automatically delete that recipe as soon as I just press delete. Now, of course, it's not going to actually delete the recipe from the scheduler because they haven't cleared. This is a separate macro. So if they clear the meal, this one actually clears the meal and refreshes the screen. Okay, so that's the actual one. Great. So 
we understand that the event change here is going to load that meal up. And that, of course, is the macro that we're going to go into next. So that's it. So that's all the code that you need for the worksheet. So worksheet change event, we're simply loading the recipes and running this macro here, which we're going to get into right away. This one right here, meal plan road. However, in the selection change, there's two based on the breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and based on the date selection. So that's it for the on-sheet macros. Relatively simple. Now what we're going to do is we're going to get into the meal macros. This is the module here. And we went through, this is the one we didn't go through yet. Remember, this is the one we just saw. If we look back on here, our meal planner, we see that we're going to load a macro called meal plan load recipe. Now, if we want to quickly jump to that, all we need to do is click definition. And it's going to jump ba right back to where we just were. This is the macro that I'm going to go. Now, these variables that have been dimensioned, we'll go over them as we go inside the code. The first thing what we want to do is when we're loading the recipe is clear any pictures that might exist with that same code that we have. Now we're going to be based on the with the meal planner. Now we're focused inside a macro and a module, so we need to call out the specific sheet because we're no longer doing code inside the specific sheet. Okay, once we've cleared the pictures, we need to make sure that they've selected a correct meal, correct recipe. Now that recipe, remember, is located right here in B15. That's the row that that recipe is associated with based on this recipe database. So we need to make sure that that is, if there's any error with what they've entered, it's going to show empty. So we need to make sure that there's an actual row to that. So here, we're going to check here. If B15 equals empty, let the user know, please select a correct recipe to add details. Now, maybe in the Patreon update, we'll put something like, do you want to add this as a new recipe and then give them the option. So we'd be making changes there. Assuming that it is a correct recipe, I'm going to put that into a variable, a long variable called recipe row based on what's in B15. And then what I'm going to do is just use a little bit of something we call a little bit like data mapping where I can load all the data in. So I need to basically load it because I've put that in. Now, normally, because I use this database originally, I put the calories way over here because I didn't want to upset our recipe here. I don't want to upset this, which we're using the same database here. So in this case, all I did was just simply add calories at the end, right? And then we'll make some compensation for that. So what I want to do is basically add in all this information very, very easily. And so I want to add it all directly inside here. So the first thing what I want to do is I want to start, we'll probably start in here. Calories is the end, but I'm going to start here located right here in M9. And I'm going to go category, yields, cook time, rating, nutrition, and recipe information. So all of that is going to come directly from here. Category, yields, cook time, rating, nutrition, and the last one, right? Mm -hmm. So we're going to start out in column C and move all the way over that. And then at the end, then I'll add in the calories. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to set a specific column called recipe column, and I'm going to go from three to seven, right? Remember, we said it's going to start in column C, three to seven. Now what I want to do is I want to convert all that data into these rows. Now we can use data mapping to do that actually very, very easily right here because we know that I know that cat column category in column C, which is column three, we know that that's going to end up directly inside here in this category here. It's going to end up in M9. The next one's going to be in M10 and M11. So if I know that this is the row nine and it's going to come from column three, all I need to do is add six to compensate for that. So that's exactly what we're going to do here. So we're going to say the, the this is the, using cells. We're going to use that row. Where do I want to put the row? The row is based on the column. This is column three, the first one. This is six. So when I add those two together, we're going to get nine. So our first one's going to go in nine. And column 13. Column 13 is also here inside M. Column M is column 13. Okay. So that's how we use it. So we're simply going to loop from three to seven and add all of that data in here. And what we're going to do is we're going to add it directly from the recipe database based on the recipe row, based on the recipe column as this loops through columns three to seven. Then lastly, without data mapping, because we put it at the end, I'm going to add in the calories here inside M8, we're going to add the calories in. It's going to come directly from column M. And then the recipe information in M16 is going to come directly from H, right? Because we skipped that order. I want to put that in. So if we look into the recipe database and we go to column H, and the reason we're skipping this one, we're not adding this in, is because here, the, the columns go from G to H, which is easy. But in our meal planner, notice we've got three rows for this. This goes for, it jumps from 13 
to 16 so that's why we didn't use it, it didn't at least have one row so it's easy this one goes to 13 and then to 16 so the last one so this one here and this data we just used two lines of code in the calories we just used two lines of code and so these two lines of code add in the calories and the recipe information great so we've added all in the recipe data but now what I'd like to do is I'd like to add in that recipe picture and I'd like to place that recipe picture right down here inside these amazing teriyaki chicken meatballs okay so what I want to do is I want to fill the columns L through M and I want to place the picture directly here and place it below so to do that I need to first check the picture now if inside our recipe database here inside I want to place this picture located in column I this picture one now this picture name these picture names right here it's hard to work with columns that are so big so con continuing on so I want to place this picture and those pictures are going to come directly from this folder the same picture names are located inside this folder here now these exact names here are the same names that are located inside this database here now we know the folder so all we need to do is I need to combine these picture names with the admin folder that's located right here inside our recipe inside directly inside c5 which is our excuse me our c4 which is our recipe pictures our recipe picture so when i combine this pathway here a lot that's why those of you who are on patreon when you get it you can see that this folder when you get all these pictures if you want to test it out with my pictures set your own folder download them and make sure you set your folder right to whatever folder you've downloaded those pictures and set it right here then it'll work just fine so we need to combine this folder along with this particular database this picture name here that combination will create the full file path and it is that file path that we can add in that picture and that's just what we do so inside the code we need to do all of that first of all I want to make sure that there is actually a picture so inside the recipe database we need to make sure that I contains a value if I doesn't contain a value then there's nothing to add in so we're going to do that with a check if the recipe database based on I in the recipe row does not equal empty that means contains a picture so contains picture name right not the full file path just the picture name then what I want to do is I want to check do we have a correct folder right our correct picture folder is located inside admin c4 here the recipe picture I want to make sure that that folder contains it so we're going to run that check if the admin c4 equals empty then go to no picture right we're going to skip all of that right so there's nothing else we could probably exit the sub in that case as well okay so but if it does have a folder like in this case I'm going to put that into a variable called string variable called recipe folder and we're going to set that up right there based on what's in c4 I also want to add a backslash to that because the combination of the backslash plus, plus the picture name is going to create our full file path and we're going to do that in the next line that file path is going to be based on that recipe folder that already contains that backslash along with whatever's located in I this is our full file path once I have the full file path to the picture it's very easy to insert but I want to do run a check to make sure if the directory of that file path equals empty then we're going to go to no pick just skipping that out assuming that it is correct right then what we're going to do is we're going to use based on of course we're still based on that meal planner sheet we're going to use dot pictures dot insert and we're going to insert that picture based on the file path name then we're going to give it a specific name we always have to give it a specific name because that's how we delete it well, that specific name is going to be called rec pick right and then what we could do is we could work with it once we have inserted it then we need to size and position it we can do that with the following code first thing we want to do is focus on the width shapes that recipe picture that new name that we just assigned it we're going to lock the aspect ratio that can make sure it doesn't get contorted that does get stretched or skewed in any way possible so we're going to lock the aspect ratio once I do that I don't need to set the width and the height I only need to set one of those and since I want that specific width exactly to the specific width of both of columns all the way from L through M I want it so all I need to do is determine what is the width of between columns L through N and set the width of that picture exactly to that so we can set that up dot width is equal to the meal planner uh, columns L through N the entire width of those columns and it's going to set that shape to the column width automatically okay I want to set the left position and the top position based on L21 that cell right here L21 I want to set it based on that so we're going to use the upper left of L21 that's it that's all we need to do and it's going to display that picture so that's it for the macro meal plan load recipe it's very very simple as soon as we make a change here it's going to load all those details based on that and load the picture and size the picture according to those columns 
All right, very cool. Let's take a look at what else we have. The next macro app is going to be based on the mail. Now that we've added that, it doesn't actually save it to the database, right? It simply just adds it. Certainly, we could add that automatically if we wanted to, but it may not be necessary. So I'm going to click this Save Meal. Of course, we could add it, and it's going to save it automatically to the schedule. Maybe there, maybe somebody wants to look at different information, and they don't want to see. They don't want to save it until they. Oh, that looks really good too. Getting hungry. Okay, saving that meal is going to automatically do that. So it is this save meal that's going to actually one. It's going to save it to that database. So we're going to. It's going to save it, or it's going to update. So that same macro is either going to save it here or delete it. Notice this is the one I just cleared out. I deleted it when we cleared it. Okay, so it's either going to save it here, or it's going to update it based on that. So what we need to know is we need to know. Is it an existing meal plan or not? Right. So if I want to save it or update it, so how do we know that? Because we don't want every time we say we don't want to add a new one, we want to make sure it's existing. So that's already based on our selected recipe ID. If I selected a meal ID, I know it doesn't exist. But if, if it's not selected, if I have a brand new one, we know that there's no meal row associated to this. So B13 is going to tell us whether it is a new meal. Or it is an existing one, so that's the first thing we're going to be able to checking inside our macro called meal plan save. So first, first of all, I want to make sure that we actually do have, of course, a recipe name. M7 cannot be blank, right? If they try to save it, we need to let them know. Please make sure to add a meal before saving. So M7 cannot be blank. That's the first check we're going to run. So inside M7, if that is empty, let the user know that message box that you just saw. Please make sure to add a meal. And then what we're going to do is we're going to select M7. We're going to exit the sub. We can't add a meal if there's not been saved. First thing, what I want to know is I want to know the selected column. What I need to know: Are we focused? On, what are we on? Breakfast? Are we on lunch? Are we on dinner? Right? I need to know which one, which meal we're going to add. And my personal favorite, let's add pancakes to that because it just looks so good. And so what I want to do is I want to make sure that we understand exactly where's pancakes. <laughs> French fruit tart. That's one's pretty good. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to know all what meal are we adding. And we, if we remember correctly, when we make that selection change on breakfast, lunch, or dinner, that that column is going to be located right here in B11. B11 is going to tell us 12 is breakfast, 13 is lunch, 14 is dinner. So that's going to let us know that. So we're going to do that right here. So the selected column is going to be into a long variable. That's going to be the selected meal column: 12, 13, or 14. Okay, so now what I want to do is I want to determine: Are we saving a brand new meal or are we saving an existing? And of course, B13, as I mentioned, is going to let us know that. If B13 is empty, then we know it is a new meal. Otherwise, it is an existing meal. So if it's a new meal, we're going to do a few things, right? I want to make sure that we're going to be adding it to a brand new row based on our database, and we need to assign that first available row. In this case, it would be 58 is that first available row. So we're going to get that first available row into a variable called the meal row. That meal row is going to be meals database A and XLAP plus one. That's our new email row. And also, what I want to do is I want to set that meal ID. We know based on the formula here that we set that max formula located right here in B14. We know that that next email ID is going to be 56. All I want to do is take that 56 and put it in two places. I want to place it directly here inside B12. That's the first place, and I also want to put it inside our row, our first available row. I want to put it in column A in that row here. So I'm going to put that ID in two different places, and we do that here. So B12 is going to take on that next meal ID. That's Put it in the put put in next meal ID, and also I want to set it directly inside column A, and that meal row is going to also take on whatever's in B14, and that is also our next one. So our next meal ID is going to go directly in those two places. But what if it's an existing meal? If it's an existing meal, all we need to do is extract the row what's from B13. That's going to extract the row. Everything else, everything else is going to be regardless. Visit is it a new meal or if it's an existing? The first thing what I want to do is I want to set that meal ID. That's very important. And so, what do I mean by that? Well, if we remember correctly, inside this, that meal ID, breakfast, lunch, or dinner. When I save it, I want that meal ID to go in one of those. So if I select it, I want to make sure that that meal ID goes into directly in B15. If I decide to add a brand new meal, and I want to put, if it's a breakfast, let's take a look. This is breakfast. I want to put that meal ID. It's going to be 56 because it's a brand one. I want to put that directly in B16 as soon as I save it. So we're going to save the meal. 
And now you see, if we take a look at that, 56 is now in here. If I decide to add a lunch, that next meal ID, if I click on lunch here, and I add that meal ID here and I save the meal, it's going to put that next meal ID directly inside lunch ID. So I want to place it. Now, how do we know that? Well, if I know our selected meal column is 13 and I want to place it directly in 17, all we need to do is add 4 so we know where to place it. So B and the selected column, 12, 13, or 14, plus 4 is going to be 16, 17, or 18. So this is going to be equal to whatever's in B12. B12 is our set meal ID. That way we have a specific meal ID, breakfast, lunch ID, or dinner ID in these very specific cells. So that's all we do is simply taking the ID here and placing it directly in there based on what meal type it is. Okay, so now that we've got our meal ID set in the correct meal type, now what I want to do is simply add all the information to our database. So the recipe name is going to go in column C. So now we're going to just take the information, meal database, our recipe name is going to come here, going to go directly inside B, and then I want to put the meal type. Is it breakfast, lunch, or dinner in C? So how do we get that? Well, if we know, we know that our breakfast, the words breakfast, lunch, or dinner, we know it's located in row 5. And we also know that it's located in based on the selected column, right? What do I mean by that? If we take a look here, we see that these words here, breakfast, lunch, or dinner, they're located in 5. And we know that it's column 12, 13, or 14. So all we need to do is combine row 5 with either 12, 13, or 14 to extract the name of the meal, breakfast, lunch, or dinner. And we do that right here. So that here, here, row 5, the selected column is breakfast, lunch, and we're going to place that directly in column C. I want to place the date in column D. That's going to come directly from L3. I want to know the calories, right? That's going to come from M8. Now, I want to know the calories separately, why I'm saving it. Sure, they're certainly saved already inside a recipe database located here in column M. But what I want to do is I also want to save them directly in the database because I want to add up the total calories for the day. If I use going to sum if, and I want to know all the calories for let's say January 6th, I know that it's going to be combined these calories. And so that's how we can get the total calories and I can place them up here. We're going to use the sum if formula. I know I'm kind of jumping around, but we're kind of here. Sum if we have a named range called meal date. So I want to know all of the calories based on that date here, L3, and I want to know the meal calories. So I've created named ranges for meal categories, named ranges for meal dates, those dynamic named range based on this date, named ranges for this date, named ranges for this, so I can easily sum the total calories per date. That's why it's very important to put the calories in E. And I also want to know the meal type row. That's the last thing we're going to add, 16, 17, or 18, right? If I'm adding breakfast, this is breakfast, it's going to be 16. I want to put this row here, and that makes it a lot easier because when I load up that information, I know exactly what row, 16, 17, or 18, to place that ID. When I load a specific day, I want to know exactly where to place those here. So if I load in this day, I know what to do, 55. So that's how we're going to do it there. So that's the last part of information. That is going to come in column F. And basically, it's the selected column, 12, 13, or 14, plus 4. So 16, 17, or 18. That's going to be our set meal type row. Placing that there. Then all I'm going to do is run the macro to refresh the plan or schedule. That's it. That's all we need to do there. Great. So what about when we clear that? Notice that we cleared the meal plan. There was another macro tied to this button here. So that, of course, that save macro that we went over is also tied to this button here. Just so you know, that is the macro. This is called macro save meal plan save meal. The macro we just went over here is located and it's tied to that button there. Clear meal. If this button, I've got a brand new uh, macro called clear meal that we want to actually clear the meal. If I select a meal, I want to be able to clear that meal. And I want to clear it not only from this information here, but I also want to clear it from the schedule as well. So if I want to clear this meal and I just clear that breakfast, it's automatically be cleared out. And to do that, what we're going to be doing is relatively simple. First thing what I want to do is I want to make sure I, has it been saved or not, right? Because there's two different functions. If I add a meal here, it's not been saved. Notice it's not on schedule and I click clear meal. All I need to do is just clear the contents. However, if it has been saved, if I add a meal here and it has been saved to the database, I need to also clear it from the database row here. So I need to clear it. I may need to clear the database row, keeping the IDs, but clearing the rest 
or do I just clear the content? So how do we know that? Well, if it's been saved already, we know that here inside B13, it's gonna already have a selected meal row. So we're gonna use that with us. We're gonna check that to make sure that there is a row associated with that. B13 is gonna tell us. So if B13, right, is empty, that means it hasn't been saved, we can skip deleting it from the database, which is the next row. So the meal row is gonna be based on B13. Then we're gonna basically clear the contents. I'm gonna keep that ID, I like to keep at least a single column of data. So we're gonna keep that ID in column A and all I'm gonna do is clear the contents between B and F. That's gonna clear all the meal details. And that's sufficient enough so that it doesn't appear on the schedule. Then all we need to do is I also wanna clear out the picture. That's gonna be regardless if it does exist. I wanna clear that out, again, using these three lines of code and clearing out any picture that might exist. Next up, all I need to do is clear the contents regardless if it's been saved or not. We're gonna clear the contents M7 through N20. Then all we're going to do is run the macro that's going to refresh the schedule. That's it. That's all we need to do for the meal plan to clear. Next up is a meal plan load. And you notice there's two different macros that I want to go over with you. One, we're going to load the day. If I select day, we're going to load that day. Okay, so only one. So we're going to, we're going to set it breakfast. There's another macro that's going to load specifically the meal plan. This one will load this meal plan. This one will load this meal plan. This macro has been assigned to this shape. So if I take a look inside this shape here, right click, assign the macro here and take a look. We see that it is called meal plan load meal, meal plan load meal. That is the one that I wanna go over along with meal plan load day. Load days, if we select a specific day, will go in order. If I select a day, we wanna load that day. Those are two different macros. Now the load day is based on selection change. So if we take a look back inside the meal planner, remember when we're making a selection change, we're going to load the day right here. So making the selection change on the schedule, we're running that macro called load day. Now we're gonna go over that macro where we actually load that day. So on that day, we, what we wanna do is again, we wanna clear any recipe picture, any picture that might help. I also wanna clear the contents of all the recipe fields. I wanna clear also B12 as well. So B12 of course is our set meal ID, right? I wanna clear that out. If there's any meal ID, I wanna clear that out. And also what I want to do is I want to run a macro that's gonna load all of the details for that day, right? So we've done all the work on our meal planner, but I wanna focus on the database. And now what I wanna do is basically what I wanna do is I want to load all of the associated recipes in that day. So how do we do that? Well, we know that this is the day six. So we've got that day, we've already set that day here. As we add in here, we notice that day is gonna be either in here, both in uh, L3 and also located in B10. So we know the date here. So what I wanna do is I wanna run an advanced filter and I wanna know up to, of course, three meals that might be located on that specific day. And if we take a look back inside our database, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna run an advanced filter. I'm gonna base it on a specific day. Now it's gonna be based on this date. Now, of course, this is a day, but it's in numerical format, which I prefer, but this is a date that's gonna be based on B10. That is the selected day of our meal planner. I'm gonna run an advanced filter and I wanna know all the meals associated with it. In this case, just one, crispy honey chicken, is the only one on that day, okay? So it's the only one on that. So how do we know that? So if we take a look inside the meal planner, we look at seven, we know that crispy honey chicken, also looking quite good, gonna have to make all these, is the only one on that day that we have. So we're gonna run that advanced filter and that's just what we're gonna do inside the code here. So we're gonna determine the last row of the meals database. And if it's less than three, we're gonna exit the sub. We're gonna run that advanced filter based on A2 through F. And then our criteria is going to be M2 through M3. So inside our meals database, we're gonna run that advanced filter based on A2 all the way through F. Our criteria is gonna be M2 through M3. And I want those results to appear directly here, all the way on P through U, P2 through U2. That's where our results are gonna come from. And that's where we want it. Then all we need to do is loop through the results here. Okay, so inside that, our results are coming from P2 through U. Then I wanna determine the last results row based on column P. If it's less than three, then there's no meals. We're gonna skip all this, there's nothing. If there are meals, I'm gonna run a loop from three to the last results row. I'm gonna set that meal type row. Remember that meal type row, very, very important located here. 16 for breakfast, 17 for lunch, 18 for dinner, right? And take a look back in here, why we have it. 16 for lunch, 17, 16 for breakfast, 17 for lunch, 18 for dinner. So I need to know the row because I wanna take that ID, I wanna take that ID right here and I wanna place it in row B16. So that's all we need to do. Very, very easy when we program it like that, putting that ID located. So we know that breakfast contains that. And so that's what we're gonna do. So simply putting that 
row, 16, 17, 18, into a variable, and then meal planner B and the meal type row simply equals P that meal ID. That meal ID is going to be placed directly in there. And we're going to be that for every single one. And that way for those months where we have all the meals are going to be all be filled in. Let's take a look at this one here in the next month here. I don't like that here. Let's shrink that up a little bit. Next month here, we see that, uh, let's go, this one here has got a full date. So we want all three of those meals to come both all 16, 17, and 18, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and placing those directly, those IDs directly inside here. 13, 14, and 15, those IDs will go right there. So once we have that, we've placed them all directly in that, then what I want to do is I want to select something. If I want to just select breakfast. If B16, right, check in breakfast, doesn't equal empty, then I'm simply going to select it. So if it's so let's take a look inside let's go with one this one right so this one's got breakfast i select a day here notice that breakfast automatically loads up i select a day here there's nothing here because there's no breakfast which is fine so that's what i want i want to load the breakfast if it's there all right so we can do that if b16 does not equal empty then meal planner select that and what that's going to do is automatically when i make that selection change on l5 it's automatically going to load that breakfast right so if i select here right and i select here again it's going to automatically load that breakfast that's why i select something else select it selecting that breakfast is going to load that those breakfast details directly in there okay continuing on so now that we've done that now what i also want to do is i want to select m7 that's going to give the user the opportunity to then add it in so if there's one day without breakfast they it's our m7 is already selected all they need to do is add the breakfast, click save, and it's going to add it. Relatively simple. So that's it for loading the day. Remember, that's a selection change based on a day. The next step is the macro that I want to go. When we select specific mail, then I want to load that meal directly there, that meal I want to load. So that is a different macro. That's the macro that's assigned. So each of these shapes here have a macro assigned here, and we'll zoom up, and we want to assign that macro there. So how are we going to do that? Well, that's basically it, a relatively simple macro that we can assign. All we need to do is assign it to our samples, and it's automatically going to be assigned. And we see that it's called plan load meal. So we want to load a specific meal. That is the next. We just went over load date. Now we load meal. So how do we do that? Well, if we take a look inside this shape, I want to know this meal picture, crispy honey chicken, whether we select on the description or whether we select on the picture, it's going to load the same one. So the same macro is going to be loaded here. So how do we do that? Well, what I want to do is I want to know that ID. This is called meal. This shape is called meal name 57. 57 is the ID that's associated with that. And this one's called meal picture 57. Okay. So what I want to do in this one is I want to extract that 57 from there and I want to make sure that that 57 if I know that ID and I put that ID and I know it's 57 here I want to place that 57 directly inside B12 and then we know the row once we know the row we can extract everything from it so that's just what we're going to be doing first of all we want to set that meal row to zero just for to start it out and I want to get that meal ID remember I said I have to extract that meal ID now notice these two shapes this one says meal name and a M seven characters and then 57. This one says meal pick, seven characters and then 57. So if I know they both start with seven characters, what if I just remove the first seven characters? Whatever is remaining is going to be that ID. And that's what I've done here. Meal ID is we're going to replace. We're going to look for the first, the most left seven characters right here using the left of the application caller. The application caller is automatically the name of the shape that called it. Please keep in mind that if you try to run this macro from here, you're going to get a bug. And that's simply because there's no shape that called it. You ran it from here, right? So, so using this continue, that'll always bug. But if we run it from a shape, it'll work just fine. So we're going to take the first seven characters, and I'm going to use the replace function. And I'm going to replace it with nothing. What that's going to leave us with is that ID. It is that ID that we want to do. And what I want to do is I want to find that ID. I want to know that meal or I want to make sure that it's a correct ID. I want to make sure it is found, right? There's a few ways to do that. We can place that meal ID directly in the cell, or we can just use the find. But this time what I want to do is I want to run find. So I want to use the find function. I'm going to look for that inside our name range called meal IDs. And what I want to do is I want, if it's not found, it could create an error. So therefore, I'm going to wrap that in on air, resume next, and on air, go to zero. And I want to extract the row. Once I know the meal row, and I want to make sure it's not zero. If it's zero, that means it's not been found. We're going to exit the sub. I want to set that meal date. I want to know what is the date of that meal. I'm going to put that in B10, right? 
B10, remember, B10 is always our selected date here. Selected date here is going to be B10. So if I select something here, I want to make sure, or select this one here, I want to make sure that that seventh date gets placed directly inside B10 because this date that is linked to this cell right here inside L3. So we want to make sure that is because it's very important that we load that. So B10 is going to take on the date, and that's going to come directly from D in the meal row. Remember, once we have that row associated, we know that that date is located right here inside column D and the middle row. I'm going to take the date, extract it there, and I'm going to place it directly inside B10 right here. So once we have the date, then we can move on with the code. I also want to set the meal type as a row. I want to know what meal type. And that meal type is going to come directly from F. Column F is going to be that meal type, column F, right? Because I need to know what are we going to select, breakfast, lunch, or dinner. I need to know what we're doing because if it is a lunch, I need to make sure that lunch gets selected. If it is a breakfast, I need to make sure that breakfast gets selected. So we need to select either based on row five, whether it's going to be column 12, 13, or 14. So once we have that meal type in a row, it's much easier because this meal type of row is going to be either 16, 17, or 18. So then I need to set the meal column, right? I want to know 12, 13, or 14. 12, 13, or 14. So I need to take, I just need to subtract four to do that, right? So 12, 13, or 14. Once I have that meal column, then all we need to do is select it. I want to run the meal plan. I want to run the macro that's going to automatically load the day. We're going to run this macro. It's going to load all the meals associated with that day. Once I have all the meals associated with that day, all I need to do is simply select on whatever column that they have breakfast, lunch, or dinner, right? Based on that row, based on the meal column. Five, meaning row five, and column 12, column 13, or column 14. Selecting that, because as soon as I select it, it's going to automatically load the associated meal. So that's what, no matter what they select, breakfast, lunch, and if I decide to add a dinner, it's automatically going to be selected too, and saving that dinner. Now we have dinner, so we notice that dinner column is now selected, because we know that that's column 14 right there. Okay, great. So that's it. That's how we load the meal. Very, very simple. That's all we need to do as far as focus on the meal. The next few macros, which we're going to need to right now, are based on that schedule, that planner, that monthly schedule, planner refresh. That's what we're going to go over right now. Now, I've dimensioned a bunch of variables, which we'll get into as we come up in the code. Okay, so we've got a meal shape. This variable is based on a shape. Of course, meal shape is shape. Now, what we want to do, the first thing what I want to do is when refreshing the schedule, is I want to clear out all of the shapes associated. Now, this shape is called meal pick 59. This is called meal name, right? So I know that any shape that contains meal pick or any shape that contains meal name, we need to remove. So we can use that inside the code. If it's not found, it could create an error. So we're going to wrap it on our zoom next. So we're going to look at every single shape inside the shape using for each meal shape in the meal planner shapes. If using the in string command meal shape, the name contains the word meal pick, and that's greater than zero, then I want to remove it and delete that shape. And we're going to do the same thing for the meal name. Any shape that contains the word meal name, meal shape. So we want to make sure being very careful that any other shapes on our sheet don't contain those words, otherwise they're going to be removed. So we need to make sure that we're using very specific and very unique names inside our scheduling shapes. Okay, the next thing what I want to do is basically what I want to know is I want to know all of the particular meals inside any given month. So this one, of course, has a lot. So the best thing to do is run an advanced filter, my favorite, and it's going to be based on every single day inside that month. So when I run, run that filter, we're going to use it based on this. Again, another advanced filter, but this time we're going to use all dates within a specific month. So we need a different criteria. Here it was based on a single date, but here it's going to be based on the date of a month. And so we know that the first of the month is based on that month start. That is the same name range that we're using right here inside B4 called month start. So we know any specific date that is greater than or equal to that and anything less than or equal to the last day of the month. So we need a little bit of a formula to help us out using the EO month, the end of the month formula. And so the less than or equal to the end of the month formula, the month of a start date, and then no months ahead and no months behind, so that's going to be zero. So that's going to get us our last day of the month. And now we want them in numerical format when we're using advanced filters, and that's going to be much better for any type of date format It will work regardless of your system. So I'm going to run advanced filter based on the criteria of J2 through K3. And I want, again, I want those, all those results to come directly in the same results, P through U, 
and we want those results to come down here. And then what I want to do is I want to loop through all those results and determine based on the date. And then I'm going to look for that date using loops. So then I'm going to run a loop. I'm going to run a loop from here to here, checking for all those dates. If the date is found, then we know to load it up. So we're going to do just that with the following lines of code. They'll determine the last row. If it's less than three, that means we have no data and we can skip it entirely. Running that advanced filter all the way from A2 through F is going to do that. That's going to get us our, and of course we have the criteria here. Let's bring that up. It is the code that I actually want to reduce there. This code here, and this is the one. So here I want to run that advanced filter based on that criteria here. That criteria, of course, as we just mentioned, J2 through K3 is the criteria that we want to use right here. And now what we want to do is we want to copy it to P2 through U2. And we want unique to be true. I'm going to determine the last results row based on column P. If that's less than three, that means there's no data for that month and we can exit out of it. Okay, so we've selected a day. Let's select that month here. Refresh the month. That's going to give us that, that data back inside here, which is what I want. Going back in here, now we have all the data, which I like. So now that we have that data in here, what we can do is we want to set the height, right? I want to know the height of the day. That way, if the rows change, and I should probably do the columns too. But, so what I want to do is I want to split these shapes. So we know that the rows right here, all the way here, rows 12 through 16 has a certain height. Now, Every single meal is going to be one third of that because we have three meals in a single day. We want to make sure that the height of these shapes is one third of that. So we can set that specific meal. So what we want to do is I want to first set the row height. That row height is going to be here located called day height. It's simply going to be we're going to use five through ten. We're going to use this row. Any of them, they're all the same. So rows five through ten, I want to set that into a specific height. I know the entire height of a day. So we're going to use five through ten. That's going to get us the height of all of these rows combined. Then we know because then we're going to have to split it by three. Okay, so we have that. I also want to know because we're going to be displaying pictures, I want to know that recipe folder that's going to be located in C4 along with the backslash. We're going to be displaying those pictures and we'll need to know the folder where they are located. Then what we're going to do is we're going to run a loop through all of those results. Every single one of those meals inside that month, starting at three, going all the way to the last one here in 50, I want to run a loop through all of them. Okay, so that's going to be our first loop. Inside that loop, we're going to run two additional loops. First loop I want to do is I want to start on rows, right? We want to start starting here. I want to know what row, four, 11, 25, right? So we're skipping rows and I want to look for all the dates and then we're going to run columns. So the first thing what I want to do is I want to run those rows from 4 to 39, stepping 7, right? We need to step 7, 4, 11, 18, and so on and so forth. So the next step is what I want to do with the columns, right? Column E is 5, and then the last one, I want to run a column, right? So 5 to 11. We're then going to run a loop through all the columns. I'm going to check here. Here, I'm going to check in each one of these cells. I'm checking for the date. And I want to find out, does is there a match, right? Is there a match? We should really change the selection change on that. Not necessarily to do that, but it's okay. It's fine. All right, so what I want to do is I want to make sure that when we've selected a specific date, if the date is found, if there's a match, the date of this, I'm looking for this. The date of this here, January 6th, is there a match, right? If it is, then we know we need to place both the recipe and the picture. So using these two loops, we're going to check here. Meal planner, the cells, the plan row, the plan column, this is the date right here. Is it equal to the meal date? If the date is, then we're going to add it, right? That meal date we've already put inside a variable here called meal date. That variable is a date variable called meal date. So we're going to check for that, right? And I want to make sure that it's been found, right? If it has been found, then we can then we know we need to add that meal to our calendar. We're going to set the meal ID. We know that's located in column P right above here, column P. Then I also want to know the meal type row. That's going to be located in column U. Right. So I want to put that meal type row, that row here all the way at the end here, it's going to be located in column U. So we want to put that into a long variable as well. Once I have that, I also want to know the picture name. Now, how are we going to know the recipe name? The recipe name is going to be based on column Q. Q is going to let us know the recipe name. Why is that important? It's important for two reasons. One, we need to, of course, add that to this text. But I also need to look up inside a recipe database here. I need to find that recipe name. I need to know what row it's on. And then what I need to do is I need to check I. I want to check column I. Is there a picture on that? If it is, then we need to display the picture. So that's very, very important. So we need to know the name. And I need to know the row that that recipe is located on and if it's found. If it's not found, it could create an error. So we're going to wrap in an on error resume next. 
and on error go to zero. We're gonna set that recipe row. It's gonna be based on the recipe database, based on that named range called recipe name. We're gonna look for it using the find command. I'm looking for the recipe name. We're gonna look in the values and look in the hole, and we wanna extract the row if it's found, right? If it's found, I wanna expect that row, and I wanna put that row into the variable. Then what we do is we're gonna check if it doesn't equal zero, it was found. Then the recipe picture is gonna be equal whatever is in I, column I, in that recipe row. It's gonna get the picture. Then what we want to do is I want to create a full file path for that picture. So I'm going to add in that folder along with the backslash that we've created with the picture. And that's going to be our full file path, picture path. Once we have that, that's going to help us. Okay, next up what I want to do is I want to set the left position. What is that left position? That left position is going to be based on the meal planner, the cells, the plan row, the plan column. Set the left position based on the, the cells. Now I also want to know the top position. What's that top position going to be? But it's slightly different. That top position for breakfast is here. The top position for lunch is here and dinner is here. So that top position is relative based on the type, right? Based on that type. Remember that type is located right here. That's why it's so important to have that type. Let's set, set the month. Let's, let's add more data here. Refresh. Okay, so going back in here. So that type is going to be 16, 17, or 18. So I know breakfast is 16. It's going to appear at the top. Lunch is going to appear in the middle, 17 and 18. So it's based on these numbers here. Right. So knowing that and moving ahead, so what I want to do is I want to use a little bit of a formula to determine that top position. And that top position is going to be based on the top of that cell, the top of that cell, plus something. Plus what? Well, if it's breakfast, right, it's going to be the very top. Breakfast, of course, we will not be adding to that. Those beautiful pancakes are going to be right at the top. And we want those look good. And we want those right at the top. So we're not adding anything. So how do we add nothing? Well, we know that breakfast is 16, right? So how do we do that with a formula? So if we're, we're thinking about breakfast, 16 minus 16 is zero. So if I multiply zero times anything, of course, it's going to be, right, zero, and we know there's nothing to add. But what if it's lunch? What if it's 17? If it's 17, 17 minus 16 is one. If we multiply one times what? Remember, we have the day height. I need to know the height of the day. If I divide that by three, I know the individual height of every single, right, every single shape, whether it's a picture or the name, then I know the shape, the height of that shape. If I multiply it times either the shape, I will get that. So that means the height of this shape here, if I multiply times one, I'm going to get this position right up here, this position right here. And so if I know that position, then I know exactly where to place it. Dinner's going to be the same thing, except this time dinner's going to be 18 minus 16 is going to get us two. Then we're gonna multiply the height times two, divided, of course, divided by three, that height times two, and that's gonna get us that third position right down here for dinner. So we can get it based on those numbers there. So that's gonna set the top position based on breakfast, lunch, or dinner. So we're ready. Now what I wanna do is I wanna set the picture. So the best thing to do is we've created a sample shape and I wanna set the picture. Now take a look at these two. You saw them a few minutes ago. These two shapes down here, this is our sample picture. This is simply just a square with a fill picture. And we're using a sample picture here. So if we were to go into right click and then size in the properties and we see here inside this fill, we're basically filling it with a picture or text, right? So we're inserting a picture based on that here, basing it on those those pictures here. So I've got them heel he here, right here in the meal planner here, and the pictures here. So I'm basing it on this picture. I just set this default picture. So we're going to insert a picture. And I've given this a specific name. The name of the shape is called sample picture. Make sure it's not the same name. We don't want it deleted. And I've given this one the text value where we want the text, the name of that recipe. And this is called sample description. So once we know that, we can then work on it. So the meal plan, that sample picture, that shape that I just showed you, we're going to duplicate that. I'm going to give it a very specific and very unique name. It's going to be called meal pick. As we saw before, we know the shape's called meal pick. And I want to put the meal ID combined with it. Remember, we remove the first seven characters. That's how we get the meal ID. This is going to give us that specific name for that. Once I have that, we can work with it. So with the meal planner, meal picture, we're going to focus on that. Now what I want to do is I want to check to make sure that that path of that picture is an accurate path to make sure it is correct. So if directory file path does not equal empty, and I want to make sure the picture does not equal empty, that picture, making sure, then what we're going to do is we're going to fill that shape, this shape right here, we're going to fill it with a user picture, and that user picture is going to be the file path. This adds the picture to the shape. It fills the picture to shape. Once we have that, all we need to do is simply place the picture. So I'm going to set but I want to do is a little bit more interesting, right? Notice that that lunch, the picture's on the right, 
and breakfast and dinner breakfast is on the pictures on the left so i've alternated it up a little bit so if we, we know that uh, this is 16 17 and 18 right so what i want to know is the meal type row is 17 breakfast is 16 lunch is 18. if it's 17 then we want to do something different a little bit break it up i want to put the picture on the right and the text on the left so we can do that right here if the meal type row is 17 then reverse the name in the picture for lunch we need to reset the left position the left position of that picture is going to be more over to the right right so how far more over it's going to be the whatever the current left position plus the width of the sample description right i want to take that sample description plus one just a little bit over else the left position is the left position plus one basically i just don't want it directly on that border i want it slightly away so if we zoom into that we see that the pictures are placed slightly away one pixel if it was over a little bit it would be more like that if it was directly on it so that's all we have to do to in order to set the left position and set the top position. And top position is simply equal to the top of the position. We've already defined the top position here, so we just need to set it here. And then set the height. I want to know the height is going to be the day height divided by three. This, this confirms the shape. And that way it's really important if we decide to change the height of these rows, automatically the pictures and the text will, shapes will automatically adjust accordingly. Okay, great. So that sets the picture, but what about the recipe name? Now the recipe name, very, very simple. All we need to do again is take this sample here, the sample description, duplicate that, and then update the text accordingly. So that's just what we're going to do. We're going to take the sample description, we're going to duplicate it, we're going to give it a specific name called meal name, a meal ID. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to work with it. And again, just like we did with the picture, we want to reverse if it's lunch. So if the meal type equals 17, this time the left position of the description, we want the left position down here, right? We want it here. So we're going to bring the left position here. Otherwise, if it's not a picture, right? If it's breakfast or lunch, else breakfast breakfast let's put in breakfast or dinner in that case we want the left position to be over to the right again we're going to add the left position plus the width the same thing we did up here the same thing exactly we did up here we're going to do down here now so this of course adds that text on the right side if it is then breakfast or dinner okay all right then again we're setting the top position we're going to set the height just like we did and now what we want to do is we want to take the text I want inside this text, I want it to be that the recipe name. I don't want to place that in here. So we can do the text frame to text range text equals the recipe name. That sets the recipe name. Then we're just resetting the recipe row to zero because it's found. So I want to make sure to reset that to zero. And that's it. We're going to use the next column and the next row and the next result. So inside three different loops, as we loop through it, building out this schedule. That's all we need to do to build out the schedule. Very cool, huh? Just a few more macros to go, right? We noticed that we have previous month, some navigation this month and next month. I'd like to go over those right now. When it comes to, especially the previous month, we do have some limits, right? I, we can't go before year 2022, January. So we need to check if the user does try to go before January 22, you will let them know you're at the first month and the first year of the schedule. Did we went over something like this, if this looks familiar to you, and you followed our can work maintenance manager there, I believe that was it called. This was very, very similar to the calendar that we used there. Okay, so the meal planner, if B9 equals one, remember B9 is focused on that month there of January located right here. B9, that's our selected year item, that means 2022. And also our month is B5. So if both of these are one, we know to let the user know that they are already at the first one. So we can do that. If B9 equals one here, B5 equals one, then let the user know you are at the first month and the first year of the schedule and exit the sub. That's just what happened. Otherwise, what we want to know is, are we on January, right? If we're on January and we're not the first year, let's say we're in 2023 and we're on January, like we are in this case, what I need to do is two things. I need to set that month back to December and I need to reduce the years to 2022 so that both of those change to December 2022. So in that case, if B5 is one on the current January month, then what we're going to do is we're going to set B9 that previous year we're going to set it to basically whatever the current year is minus one right i want to reduce that year by one and i also want to set the month to 12. 
So we can do that here. And then B5 is equal to 12, setting it to December. If it is not January, all we need to do is simply reduce the month by one. B5 equals whatever is B5 minus one. Reduce the increment by one month. Then all we need to do is run the macro to refresh the planet. That's the macro we just went over. Next month, relatively similar, but also we want to make sure in B28, if we're on the last year, we need to let the user know. So if I select the last year, and we're on, dis let's go ahead in December of the last year, you are at the last month on the last year. So if this is nine and this is 12, then they're on the last, right? So we're gonna check for that. If B9 is nine and B5 is 12, we know we're on the last month and the last year of the schedule and it's up. So otherwise, if not, what I wanna know is also if we're not, I wanna know, are we on December? If we're on December of any year, and we go next, I want to increase the year by one and then set the month down to one. So just by that, I want to reset the month to one and increase the year by one. So we can do just that here. If B5 equals 12, then what we're going to do is we're going to increase the year by one and we're going to also set the month to January. Otherwise, it's not December. We're simply going to increment the month by one. And then we're going to run the macro refresh. And the last month is this month. If I want to set this month, I want to basically set both the year and the month to the current. It is currently today. It is March 4th, right? So I want to make sure we should color the existing day. Then maybe we'll put that on if you guys want it to know the existing day. Color that differently based on that. It would be this Friday, March 4th. Color that differently using conditional format. So this month is going to do it. So I need to set the current month and I need to set the current year located in both B5 and then that. So in, in this case, we're going to select the current year B9. So how do we do that? So this month macro, B5 is equals simply the month of the current date. That's relatively easy. And then what I want to do is I want to set B9 to that, right? I need to know, how do I know that? How do I know what the current year is? It's here. I want to set it to one, right? So what I want to do is I want to take the current year and I want to match it, right? And if I know that it's the first year, I'm going to set the select the year item in B9 to one, or if it's 2023, I want to set it to two. So we can use the find command for that. And so we're going to set B9 is simply equal to the meal planner, all the years, that's that named range for all the years you just saw, we're going to find the year of the current date. If it is found, we're going to subtract 19. What does that mean? If it's found on row 20, it's found on row 20, what do I want? I want to put 1 right here. So how do I get from 20 to 1? I just subtract 19. And that's going to do just that, subtracting 19. Then all we're going to do, if it's not found, it could create an error. So I've wrapped it in on air, resume next, and on air goes here. Then all we're going to do is simply refresh the planner. Wow, what a cool training. That is it. So we went over in this training, we showed you how to create this really cool calendar, both with dynamic days here, dynamic start days, right? And also conditional formatting to show those non-days or show specific days that we don't want on the calendar or colored differently. We also showed you dynamic years based on that, how to select and change it based on the years. The navigation, we showed you how to add a meal, right? Adding an email using conditional formatting to create this really cool tab feature using the selected cells, using the same rows and adding in the additional detail. We know how to save a meal, refresh the calendar, clear the meal automatically from both the database and the schedule. We also learned how to use these date formulas to create this calendar and conditional formatting along the way. And of course, a lot more with these really cool navigation buttons that let us automatically load the schedule, including these incredible shapes, how they populate a schedule very quickly and very easily using an amazing advanced filter and some loops. Thank you so much for joining me. I cannot wait. I love your suggestions. And if you get a chance, I've got 200 of my most amazing templates in a single zip file, and they're now coming with PDF codebooks. So you can study these incredible codebooks. They're printable, they're highlightable, you're able to edit them, and you can really learn a ton using these PDF codebooks. I'm including that as an optional add-on now with my 200 workbooks. So I hope you'll pick that up. All right, thanks so much, and we'll see you next week.